Hey, the, the, the first thing, we asked Vilma this yesterday, just kind of looking at some of the teams they've had throughout history, the, you know, the good ones that, that have, you know, been top-level talent. Where do you think, you know, obviously they got to play and show what they can do, but 2020 on paper, where do you think they'd rank among some of the uh, best teams the Saints have had over the years? On paper? I mean, I think that's, that's the biggest issue. Uh, on paper, I think it's going to be ranked right up there with the top. I, I would probably probably put it as a top three, maybe even top two. Uh, the hardest thing, the hardest thing to go back and do is go back and look at the 2011 team. And I, and I saw the conversation and uh, just analysis. The hardest thing to go back and do is you knew what that team was, you know, and we, we actually saw it. We can go back and compare and, you know, just look at the numbers and the things that they were able to accomplish. But I mean, this team on paper, this team could really, you know, challenge a lot of things that, that that team did but unfortunately we don't play it on paper and then the other thing you know my concern or my worry with this team is the injuries and then how will not having an off season um how will it truly affect them how do you think the saints uh did last year working with Davis Murray into that running back rotation, and uh, and what are you kind of expecting to see out of that group this year? I want to see more. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, when he got his opportunity, he was able to excel. He was able to really um, go out and produce, and you know, you just want to see more of it. I think that was probably the biggest thing that you go back and look at this overall season. They 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 probably should have used him more, and obviously, I know game dictates. Um, what you can do and what you have to do as far as that is concerned. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you you have to be able to try to get him the football and maybe not just as a runner, because we saw him catch the football out of the backfield, probably more so better than he had did in, um, in Oakland as well as in Minnesota. So as a receiver, I think he's a viable option, you know, but you're going to lean on Alvin for the majority of that, those opportunities. But I think also that you can use him in that manner. But as a pure runner, you got to figure out a way to get him at least 10 to 12 to 15 touches, legitimate touches uh, in a football game. Well, what's it been like for you as a you know, guy who's now been retired for you know, a decade now to, to see what's happening with the, with the way that the running back position is kind of being valued as – you know, contract negotiations and free agency and all that stuff. They're not getting paid. Uh, you have very few of them that have been able to raise that number as far as the average uh, of, of running back is concerned. And, you know, it's truly more of a specialty. What do you do? Um, can you be an every down back? You know, you have a couple of guys that are doing that, but, you know, it's more of a specialty league and that's really because of the rules and, uh, how you can protect the quarterback and advance the football quicker or faster through the air. You understand that. And so as a running back, you either have to have some versatility or be an elite, truly elite um, ball carrier. And then you have to, you know, hope that you can get to the playoffs so it really can pay off. I mean, because that's what it's, what it's really all about. I mean, once you get into that dance, as far as the playoff is concerned, you know that your possessions are going to be limited. You know, weather will normally have to play a factor and you're going to kind of lean on some of the things that you feel like that you can do best. And, you know, the other part of it that we all often sometimes forget is what can we take advantage of, you know, as far as the matchups are concerned. And so not to say that that doesn't happen necessarily in the regular season because it does, but it get ampl it, it's amplified a lot more once the playoffs hit. You mentioned uh, injuries with with this team is like one of the is that one of your bigger concerns is just some of the injury history with some of these guys and, and how they stay healthy. Do you think that's kind of the thing they got to overcome? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's two critical spots, and that's linebacker and that's tight end. You know, I I know you were able to um, address a little bit of it as far as free agency as well as uh, the draft is concerned, but at the end of the day, you know, when you're depending on some of those younger guys to come in and step up that's always, that's tricky. And then you have two guys that are coming off of uh, ACLs as far as um, the knee is concerned and, and the linebacker room. Uh, and so the, you, you lose A.J. Klein. So the question becomes, you know, how to, how do we address it? Uh, 
Dennis will get creative and, you know, with the ability to have some of those safeties, yeah, they can play a little bit more nickel. They can play a little bit more dime. But you've got to get teams in, in long down situations because if not, they're just going to run it at you. And so, you know, that, that, that's a concern. It has to be a concern. You wonder, you know, how is Davenport, uh, how is he progressing? You wonder how is Sheldon truly progressing? And now they're able to get these guys in the building. Most of them have been in the building already. But you talk about once the games start, how, how do they – how are they able to hold up? Hey, Deuce, how crazy is it for you when you think about um, how long you've been out of the game and that and that Drew is still, you know, playing <laughs> and, and not only playing, but, you know, playing at a pretty high level? I drew the old man in the room. He the old man in the building. I mean, but <laughs> it's, it's amazing to watch him be able to go out there and do it, and I think it really um, shows you how well he's prepared, how he's changed. Uh, not only how he works out, but, you know, what he eats, what he consumes. And then for him to be able to say, look, my body is okay. I think I can give it another run and then truly commit to it. I think that's probably the most amazing part about it, uh, just because of the player that he is. Look, he he's, he's not the Drew Brees of 2011. He's not the Drew Brees of 2006 either. But I think that he is still good enough and he's still an elite enough of a player that he can, you know, command the huddle, he has the respect of the players, and then the question is, can he go out and do his job effectively? That's that, That's the biggest question. And, you know, you, you listen to Sean and uh, how they will manage kind of his throws, how they even may manage some of the games that he plays in. And, and, and look, we all know Drew. Drew is not going to want to miss one play. You know, Drew, this, this one is over. You're up 21. It's 10 minutes left in the fourth quarter. Get out. That's not him. You know, he, he, he is preparing from a mental standpoint and a physical standpoint to be able to finish the game. But sometimes they, they have to protect um, Drew from himself in that instance just because he is so competitive. Dude, so if there's no crowds in the stadium and the defense can hear every single word the offense says all year long, does that become a challenge in protecting your calls and the stuff you're saying at the, the line and do you have to protect against that as an offense? It becomes a challenge, but I think also that you'll see a lot more hand signals as well. I think that's one of the things that uh, they can do fairly easy. And then what's interesting is they were probably going to change a lot of that anyway, just because of the situation in Carolina uh, with your backup quarterback, as well as with the new OC over in Carolina. They were going to change a lot of that anyway. And so uh, if they do have to, you know, if there's no crowd in there and defenses can really – hear your checks, they can hear your call, man, they're going to have so many dummy calls in there. It's it, it's going to be ridiculous where, you know, he's, he's just out there saying one word. He's out there saying letters. And some of that may be true, but Sean has always had words that you listen to or listen for. And this, this may be a hot word this week. Last week, it may have been something else, you know. And so the, 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 the key thing that for Drew and the receivers and the backs uh, you know, he'll give him a, a, a little reminder of something, and then he will always, based off of coverage or based off of something they see, he will have a hand signal that he can give to that receiver or to that back, and it, 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 it'll be like clockwork. And that's probably the thing, the advantage that they will have, if that is the case, they will have, just because most of them have been together so long. I mean, so Emmanuel, you know, he, he, he will pick it up, Sanders will pick it up, but the other guys, you know, it'll it'll be an easier transition for them. Are, are hand signals easier to protect because you're showing them while guys are trying to get lined up and stuff, or is that is is there no difference between hand signals? No, he uses them now. I mean, he uses those hand signals now, uh, and 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 some of them, like I said, they may change week to week. You know, just depending on what they see and who he is giving that hand signal to. So that's the other thing as well. You know, certain certain guys you knew that you had to really get their attention for them to be able to see it, or there may be a miscommunication. You go back and you look at the last game against Minnesota, there was a signal given, and you just have to go back and look at it. I'm not going to get – there was a signal given, and we missed it. I'll put it like that. Hey, Deuce, how confident are you that, that um, the NFL is going to be able to pull, you know, pull this off and have a season this year? I think we're just taking it day by day. I mean, I think we're all just preparing and, and, and thinking that, yes, 
uh, we will go forward. But I mean, I think I do think that there will be some type of an adjustment. You know, I, I saw some of the articles out there where um, teams are thinking about flying the same day uh, as far as games. You know, certain teams, uh, West Coast teams, yeah, it would be impossible to p- kind of pull off. Hey, Jesus, if you were still playing, what would be your biggest concern heading into the season since the NFL can't logistically have a bubble like the NBA wants to, to implement? Testing. Testing. What, what, what is our protocol? You know, are we testing every player? Are we testing, you know, the immediate family of that player? Or, um, you know, what, what, what's the protocol that we have? And so I know from an organizational standpoint and an NFL standpoint, that's what they're working on. Uh, but that, that, that is the biggest fear. And, you know, look, we, we talked about this, uh, me and Christian and Bobby the other day on the radio. It's one thing to, it's one thing to kind of say, hey, look, well, this player uh, can go ahead and get the, get the virus and he'll be okay in 14 days. Every NFL player is not perfectly healthy. There are a ton of guys that play this game and they have some underlying conditions that they're dealing with. So it would be a big risk to say, and this is even in the college world, it would be a big risk to say, oh, let's go ahead and, you know, all of those guys go ahead and get the virus now and we can get it out the way. You, it's, it's, it's just not that, it's not that easy and it's, that's a risk in itself. But I think the biggest issue is, is the testing and what mandates do we have in place to kind of protect those individuals as well as some of the coaches. I mean, because it's not like every coach is, is under 30 or, or, or in that uh, range as far as, you know, from a health standpoint. And those guys will even tell you they're dealing with some underlying health issues. So that would probably be my biggest worry or fear. And those are some of the conversations that they're obviously having uh, currently, you know, right now, even before you do go to get together as far as a, a, a group, as far as training camp is concerned. Hey, dude, so how closely are you kind of watching uh, how things progress? Now, knowing that, that Drew, whether it's it's this year, or next year, or whenever, that you know, he's, he's going to be done playing, how, how close are you watching how things kind of play out between Taysom and, and Jameis? And what's kind of your feeling on that? You're watching it close. I mean, but I, I, I guess the biggest problem, we can't see anything. I mean, we're 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 watching videos and um, going by word of mouth of as far as how both of those guys are doing, particularly in the off season. I mean, that I think that was probably that's where you're going to give the biggest advantage to Taysom. You know, they're doing they're doing exactly what we're doing. Microsoft Teams, they're doing you know some things as far as on the board and talking and and going through it. But that's still not me working with. Pete Carmichael, me working with Joe Lombardi, me working with Sean Payton, you know, and I, I, yeah, you may get with him um, for a day, but nothing like you would have done if you got with them as far as an OT, OTA is concerned. And so um, we'll watch it closely, but it won't be what we truly think either of, either of those guys would have progressed if they had had an offseason. What does it mean for you to be – a guy who's, who's from near New Orleans, you know, I think he grew up, what, three and a half hours away, um, to not only have played for the Saints, but to then get to stay around here and, and do the, uh, do the uh, radio analysis. Man, it's, it's, it's a unique blessing for me. Um, I mean, most of you that have followed me and know me, I wouldn't say New Orleans was the first place that I wanted to go. I thought that I would be off the board a lot sooner and quicker or faster than pick number 23. But it ended up being a true blessing in disguise because my family got to see me play. Look, man, I played my high school ball, I played my college ball, and I played my pro ball all within probably about a five and a half hour window as far as driving is concerned. And that's total. That doesn't happen a lot. And so it ended up being just a true blessing. And then to be able to, like I said, have my family, my friends have that opportunity where they could drive and see me play, you know, that doesn't happen often. And then to have the opportunity to be able to just talk about the game and um, be involved with the organization, uh, you, you know, you, you, you truly, you're humbled. You're humbled by it. But at the same time, you know, for me, I know that, 
I want to go out there and prove and show from a knowledge standpoint of some of the things that I learned. And, you know, a lot of times you may question, man, why, why aren't you, why aren't you coaching? You know, why aren't you teaching more um, as far as the game is, is concerned? Because I had, I feel like I had some of the greatest teachers of the game as far as football is concerned. Um, you know, obviously with Sean, Mike McCarthy, uh, Coach Cutcliffe, uh, I felt like that, you know, from a football standpoint, they, they were some of the best teachers that you could you, you could imagine and have. And so that's one of the things that I want to be able to give back and just to be able to share some of the knowledge and things that I see and uh, that I'm able to, you know, be able to understand. And so for myself, it, it, it was just truly a, a blessing in disguise because, like I said, um, going into that draft back in 2001, there was no way that I would have figured uh, that I would be there at pick number 23. You think all that uh, stuff that you learned from those coaches helped you out when you're up in the booth? No doubt about it. I mean, just from a formational standpoint, from a situational standpoint, from what the defense is giving you, what they're thinking, uh, I, I think that that is definitely helping. And um, one of the things probably about two years, maybe three years ago, that I really wanted to improve on from was just from the defensive side of the ball. So talking to Coach Allen Dennis and talking to Mike Nolan a little bit, just picking their brains and – you know, and obviously I know JV was on as a former player. One of the things that I wanted to do with him when we were playing was, hey, look, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm seeing. How do you react? You know, what are you reading? And so just being able to pick some of the guys that you truly know and you trust as far as what they're seeing, what they're understanding, I think that just brings brings it closer together as far as a unit is concerned, and that just brings you – um, from a knowledge standpoint, you know, it gives you gives you an edge. I mean, because in this game, from a talent talent standpoint, not to say you're all the same, but let's just put you, there's not a true gap as far as range is concerned, as far as talent. It's 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 the knowledge. It's it's, it's how quick can I process something? It's it's from uh, an understanding, you know, situational football. Uh, what what individual can process that, you know, and how can he take that and use that to his advantage? Hey, Deuce, what are your thoughts about the running backs behind Kamara as well as Murray? As far as just overall thoughts on them or? Yes. Yes. I think they're fine as far as the backs behind them. I mean, I know uh, just talking to Coach Joel, they, they're always trying to find, um, you know, a guy that can come in and fit a role. They're, they're, they're always looking for that. I mean, they're always going to be able to find a guy that what what's his role? You know, what's our vision for him? That's what Sean always talks about as far as a player. What's our vision for him? And so I think one of the unique things that you see them kind of do this past year, really the last two years, you go back even with Boston Scott, was if this player goes down, do we have someone in the building or on the practice squad that we can bring in and kind of plug and play. You know, you don't want to have to be, uh, from a drastical standpoint, from an offensive uh, game planning standpoint, where you have to change everything completely. You know, you may get away from a few plays uh, if Alvin is not up and he's not available. You may get away from a few plays that he really does uh, well. I mean, it, it, that goes back with Sean when me and Reggie uh, w w were playing. And so, you always want to have a guy in the building that may not be on an elite talent level as far as um, Alvin is concerned and, 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 and Latavius is concerned, but you have somebody that maybe can do a little bit of what they do and it doesn't change so much from a philosophy-wise for you from an offensive standpoint. So the guys that are, that are behind them, uh, as far as those two guys, I, I really think that they will have a role and it'll be interesting. I mean, because you got you to remember um, – there's only so many that you can dress and there's only so many that you can keep as well. And so it'll be interesting to see how many true tailbacks they do keep and then how many, um, you know, fullbacks uh, they're going to have on that roster. But I think they're fine as far as guys that they have behind them.